Good evening. I am deeply grateful for the opportunity to be a speaker, to be a part of this gathering, and I thank the Foundation for enabling me, inviting me to do so. I also am acutely aware that I'm standing between you and dinner. And that will cause me to speak in a rather telegraphic fashion. Please appreciate that um, the points I am attempting to make today are more sophisticated in conception than the brief introduction of them will allow. But I want to build upon what the other speakers have, have said, put my bottom line up front. I also am an optimist. There are a lot of problems in this part of the world. There are a lot of problems in all parts of the world. But as somebody who has worked in and on the region for just shy of 50 years now, these are in many ways the best of times. What I'm going to do in the next few moments is to talk about some of the stakes and the stakeholders in this region of the world. And then focus a little more closely on the perceptions and policies of three countries, the United States, China, and Japan. I should have better sense than to talk about Japan's policy with a member of the diet here. Uh, but it may provide a basis for discussion over dinner. <laughs> Stakeholders in East Asia. It's about the same list as a list of all countries in the world. Particularly if one thinks about East Asia as I do which is the, as the Asia-Pacific region. To me, it is nonsensical and unhelpful to try and think about an Asia that doesn't have the United States as a part of it. It is the most dynamic region in the world. It's a region of superlatives, the biggest economies, the most people, the most nuclear weapons states, the largest militaries in the world, the biggest economies in the world, the largest trading nations in the world, on and on and on. If one had time to go into the domestic, it's the region with the most old people. It's also the region with the most young people green and gray. The expectations of youthful populations and the needs of aging populations. It's a rapidly urbanizing region. It's a region of tremendous change and by and large tremendous success. The exception, the outlier to that dynamism and that success is, of course, North Korea. Peace, stability, relative security in the region make this dynamism possible. Have made it possible for literally billions of people to live more prosperous, better educated, healthier and longer lives, have enabled nations destroyed by decades of conflict to become modern, vibrant economies and societies, have facilitated democratic transitions. 
they're at different stages in different countries, but they're happening. Continued prosperity requires continued security, continued peace. In that sense, everyone has a big stake, every nation, every resident. And because the region touches the rest of the world in so many ways, people who can't find East Asia on a map have a success, a stake in the success of what we in the region do. Despite the tremendous importance of security, of prolonging the decades of peace that have made prosperity possible. The region is notable also for having the least developed architecture for preservation of the peace. This region of superlatives has as a security architecture the legacy alliances, bilateral alliances, some of which were forged to deal with a country that no longer exists. But it's hard to imagine what the region would be like without those architectures. They need to be replaced with some type of collective security arrangement. But in the meantime, we've got institutions that were developed for a different time, a different set of circumstances, being asked to carry the weight of a hugely different regional and global situation. What Sasha described as an meshment is another way of thinking about interdependence. This is a region of tremendous interdependence and growing interdependence. And if the strategy that was outlined of Kim Jong-un is actually carried out, there'll be even more interdependence. That means, very simply, we're all in the same boat. It's increasingly difficult to even conceptualize what a win-lose strategy or outcome would be. Win-win, that's pretty easy. And we've seen that among most of the countries in the region now for the last three decades. Lose-lose, we lapse into conflict. Rivalries get out of hand. Historical animosities thwart plans, and procedures, and aspirations to move to a new future. But win-lose? South wins, North loses. U.S. wins, China loses. Japan wins. Korean Peninsula loses. It's inconceivable. You can't get there because of the amount of interdependence. So we've got this dynamic region, which is clearly in transition from something that existed in the last century to something else. But that something else isn't clear. The plans for getting there aren't clear. And Korea the Korean Peninsula is at the center of the problematic, to use a German term, an area that successful management of the peninsula issues makes it much easier to deal with larger regional issues. Difficulties on the peninsula make it difficult to manage the wider array. Let me turn from that general statement to look a little more closely at three of the big players. Korea clearly belongs on the list of big players, but Sasha has addressed that 
uh, question very adequately. Going first to the United States, sometimes characterized as an external balancer. I don't like that term. We're not outsiders. We're a part of the Asia-Pacific region. This is our region as well as your region. Our fate is tied to the fate of people who live here. Our success is tied to the continued success of people in the region. We have a huge and growing stake in East Asia. The Obama administration's policy of rebalancing, though very, very awkwardly described and presented, not very adequately explained, almost universally misunderstood, but to me is pretty simple at its core. This region really matters to the United States. If or as we draw down in other parts of the world to deal with domestic requirements, because we no longer will be fighting the wars that have occupied us for the last decade, the clear message that I believe Obama was in trying to send to the people of this region and who depend on this region is we're not withdrawing from Asia. We're not building up. This isn't anti-China, but we're not drawing down. So the extended deterrence, the USROK alliance, the mechanisms that are in place, the message is we're here to stay. There's also a very, very important economic message. The global trading system has broken down. The Doha round, on that, I am not optimistic. It's dead. People keep trying to pump air into this dead carcass, but it's dead. Asia is too big and too important to not move forward with new trading arrangements. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership and all of the free trade agreements within the region and across the Pacific attest to the need to do something. And also just engagement, diplomatic engagement, which is far more important in my judgment than the military presence. But we're here. An important aspect of U.S. engagement is China's rise, China's success. Not as a challenge, not as a rival, but because China's success has been facilitated in part by U.S. policy, in part by U.S. policy and policy with our regional partners, and we benefit from it. Many people employ what I characterize as a seesaw model of history. You know, the children's playground, one side goes down, the other side goes up. If China is rising, somebody must be declining. That somebody must be the United States. If the United States is in decline, it may be unreliable. If the United States is losing its economic supremacy, how can it maintain preeminence in other areas? You know where I'm going. One can read articles or hear commentators more or less every day asserting some variant of that. Sometimes, though inconvenient, facts actually are important. Go back to 1978, when Japan became the second largest economy in the world. Before China began its rise. While the Republic of Korea was still in an early stage of economic and political development. At that time, the United States accounted for roughly 26% of the global economy. 
Think of all that has changed. Think of the dynamism in this region over the 35 years since then. What's happened to the U.S. share of the global economy? It's down. It's all the way down to 25% of the world economy, a much, much larger world economy. So we've slipped about a percent over 35 years, despite such, one could argue, trivial occurrences as the end of the Cold War, the demise of the Soviet Union, the entrance of the Central European Warsaw Pact states into the European Union, the rise of Brazil, of India, of the next tier, the Indonesias, the Turkeys. The one thing that has gone down for the United States over that period is share of global population. We once had almost 6% of the world population. We now have less than 5%. Per capita basis, we're actually doing better. I say this not for bragging about the United States, but because it's important to get the facts straight. And both from the we must be engaged here because it's so important to us, and we're not leaving because we're too weak to be here. The final point I want to make about the region is that the United States is certainly not opposed to the unification of Korea. One hears occasionally the argument that the United States wants Korea to stay divided so we can keep troops in South Korea to justify having troops in Japan because that is I've never heard that in the United States. And I spent 20 years in senior positions in the US government. That reunification of Korea on peaceful terms, worked out by the people on both sides, nobody will applaud more loudly than the Americans because of the importance of that development for prolonging the period of peace and prosperity. Look briefly at China. China wants and needs peace and stability for sustained growth. A fundamental premise of Deng Xiaoping's modernization strategy. That in contrast to Mao who argued that war was inevitable and could happen at any time, Deng said war is inevitable but not imminent. There'll be 20 years of peace. That's a rolling 20 years. Chinese leaders today say peace for 20 more years. They need stability in the neighborhood because who's going to invest in China? Who's going to order goods from China to power this modernization developmental juggernaut if the region is unstable, if it looks like there might be conflict. And the Chinese are well aware that the, with the improvement of cross-Taiwan Strait relations, it's the potential for clashes on the peninsula that most endangers their own developmental strategy. Three decades of success have created new challenges for China. They've given them new tools to deal with it. But let me focus on the two pillars of political legitimacy. One is economic performance. Sustaining the rate of growth, providing tangible benefits to the people is the most important basis of legitimacy in that system. The second is nationalism or patriotism. Now let's spend a minute on each of them. China's growth rate is slowing. Slowdown is inevitable. Nobody can defy gravity indefinitely. Every nation, as it modernizes, grows rapidly at the beginning and then slows down. China is slowing down 
with a billion people that have not yet made it out of poverty and into the middle class. But their expectations of rapid transition are still pretty high. With, economic, with the economic pillar becoming a little more problematic, the nationalism pillar, which we were watching play out in the dispute over the Senkaku or Diaoyutai Islands with Japan in the Philippines and South China Sea. If you're unhappy with any aspect of China's government and you're in China, you have to think twice about criticizing that policy, except nationalist grounds, standing up for China's sovereignty, its rights, its rightful place, boxes in the leadership in ways that make stability more problematic than they were a decade ago in this region. China's system has performed very, very well over the last 30 years. It may be bumping up against the limits of what that system can handle. It's been so successful, it's changed the conditions for which the system was built. I will leave it at that. For China, the Korean Peninsula is a problem that has to be managed. I think they're more worried that the ROK or the US will react or overreact to things that the North does in ways that spiral out of hand than they are worried about things that the North might do directly. But the need to manage, the need to be helpful, the need to be seen to be helpful is very important. And finally, Japan. Hopefully, Japan is finally emerging from the two decades of economic difficulty. If growth is restored, I think it will be, I certainly hope it will be, this adds new dynamism to the region and new dynamism to the global system. That Japan, like the ROK, is deeply enmeshed in the region, deeply enmeshed with China. Still dependent for security on the United States, but really increasingly dependent for economic progress on the states in the neighborhood. Japan, understandably, and some would say finally, is rethinking its security situation, how to meet the challenges. That's not remilitarization. That's not the same as assertion. But it is occurring in the context of one other characteristic of this region, and that's historic memory. For an American, the distant past is last week. For most Asians, 300 or 250 years ago, when the Qing Dynasty was at its peak, that's a very relevant shaper of expectations for how a, an ascendant China will behave. The wars, the colonial conquests at the turn of the last century are yesterday. One can say, get over it. Look to the future. The future is far more important than the past. Easy to say if you're on the other side of the Pacific. Impossible to do if you are a political leader on this side of the Pacific. And that's a real challenge for everyone. Let me close by saying my view of Japan's orientation to Korea is different than a frequently heard characterization that Japan wants to perpetuate the division for economic reasons, that a unified Korea is too formidable a challenge, that it changes the security dynamic. 
I think that's just flat out wrong. I think Japan needs a stable Korean peninsula. It's moved beyond the stage where division works to anybody's benefit. And there's an example of a need on a part of all of us to focus on the future, think more about what we can achieve and must achieve, and less about wrongs in the past. I'll close with an observation triggered by Sasha's characterization of Kim Jong-un's approach. As is often the case in North Korea, it's tactically brilliant. Kim Il-sung was tactically brilliant. Kim Jong-il was tactically brilliant. And all three appear to be strategic disasters. So focused on little victories on small things. But the enmeshment strategy may be strategic. And here the China example may be important. I was involved directly with China normalization going back to ping pong in 1972 in Democratic and Republican administration. And when the Chinese in 1978 embarked upon reform and opening, the expectation was that increased engagement and meshment uh, involvement in a global was going to make China more independent give it greater freedom of action in the regional, regional stage and global stage. The U.S. expectation at the time was engagement by China in what was then the free world system, still in the Cold War, was going to help China to modernize, but it was going to transform China in ways that made it more interdependent, more dependent on continued stability and peace in the international system from which it benefited. 35 years later, it looks like the U.S. expectation was more accurate than Deng's prognosis. I think we all ought to think real hard about helping Kim Jong-un to succeed with this element of his tactical plan because I think we will benefit and ultimately the people of North Korea will benefit. Thank you.